Hey everyone, this is our Social Problems Lecture 3.1, Race and Ethnicity. In this uh, lecture, we're going to talk about how we define race and ethnicity, which is actually probably way more complicated than you think, uh, the historic roots of modern racism, and concepts related to the two above. Uh, this uh, is a pretty rough lecture. Uh, it's pretty rough subject matter. Um, the roughest is actually what is probably pretty modest, realistic images of African slavery uh, or African-American slavery. Uh, this is something that I think is really important for understanding our history as Americans, uh, but it is difficult. And I am a believer in staring the difficult thing right in the face to actually understand it. Uh, so that's why I'm including it there. Um, I, I don't think, anyway, it, it's not that graphic, but it's there. Uh, we'll look at historical racism, uh, racism today, and we will also look at uh, prejudice and discrimination. So those are the things that could be uh, difficult for you to deal with if that is something that is tough for you. So first, let's talk about defining race and ethnicity. This is a point of the social construct that I was a social major for a couple years before this really sunk in fully, right? Um, this concept of a social construct is uh, both liberating and very real. So a social construct is a concept that has no objective reality outside of human definitions, but still has very real impacts on people's lives. So I would frequently say about like rules of politeness or all sorts of things, hey, it's just a social construct, right? Well, that doesn't mean things aren't real just because they're social constructs. They're real in our social world. An example of that is money. Money only works because of social constructs. It only works because we agree that these pieces of uh, cotton woven paper uh, has value. It only works that way. However, you, you explaining that to the university doesn't mean you don't have to pay a tuition just because it's a social construct, right? Or that you don't have to pay your rent or whatever right? Um, you explaining to the person at the Apple store that they could just give you the phone, um, that's not going to fly. So just like that, uh, our ideas surrounding race and ethnicity, even though they're social constructs, are still intensely real. So uh, race is, uh, the way we're defining it, a category of people who share certain inherited physical characteristics such as skin color, facial features, and stature. Typically, racial characteristics are obvious, but sometimes they are not obvious, especially to people living outside of the society. That is the nature of the social construct, is that people in different societies may perceive differences that you as an outsider may not perceive. And the exact boundaries of race are not always clear. And in reality, the boundaries of race are very rarely clear. Again, despite what some people would believe. The exact definitions of race may vary based on time, based on place, and based on things related to culture. Um, I like to say in my Social 101 classes that culture is entirely dependent on time and place. Your uh, culture is dependent on where you live physically, but also where you live temporally. Your culture, your day-to-day -day culture is different than that of your great-grandparents and is different than that of your great-grandchildren that you may potentially have someday. Uh, an example uh, of this is in the late 1800s, Irish people were often considered to be quote-unquote black right? By modern American standards, there's no way the average white Irish person would be considered black. Uh, 
but those were the racist concepts in the United States of that era because they were trying to say Irish people are less than other white people. Well, how do you say someone is less than a white person in that intensely racist era? You call them black. Very horrible. South Africa, uh, especially South Africa under the apartheid regime ranging from the 1940s to the mid-1990s. Officially, when you were born or when you entered the country of South Africa, you were given a category of white, black, colored, or Asian. Now, when we compare that to the uh, history in the United States, um, there was once a time when it was acceptable, it is no longer currently acceptable, to call a black person colored, right? That was the euphemism of about a 30 year span in the mid 20th century. That's not, that's not, that doesn't mean black, right, in South Africa, right? That never meant black. Colored people were actually people in, um, of Middle Eastern descent, basically, is what they're talking about there. And then, uh, to a certain degree, stretching over into India, even though that's part of the Asian continent, right? That's part of the murkiness of race. In the United States, to contrast, in the mid-20th century, in the mid-1900s, um, we had the categories of white, Asian, black, Native American, or as my parents would have said as children, red and yellow, black and white, right? And that, that's, that's problematic, right? Uh, definitely problematic. Definitely there's a whole lot of race problems there, but that's how people conceived of things then, right? Well, what if I'm, what if I'm Latinx? What if I am... Uh, of Aborigine descent from Australia, what like what am I then? Do I not have a race? Am I in that weird other category? Um, you can really kind of explore this by asking, like writing down on a piece of paper, uh, a very awkward piece of paper, list the races, right? The races of human beings and try to incorporate every single human being on the planet into one of those categories and you will start making a very long, again, very awkward, weird list. That's because race is a social construct. It's something that a society collectively agrees upon. Um, that's, that's, um, that's part of the weirdness of this social construct that we have called race. Ethnicity then is a shared social, cultural, and historic experience stemming from common national or geographic backgrounds that make subgroups of a population different from each other. That's ethnicity. We will define ethnic group then as a subgroup of a population with set shared of social, cultural, and historic experiences with relatively distinct beliefs, values, and behaviors with some sense of identity or belonging to the subgroup. Now our next slide, we're going to compare race versus ethnicity because those are often used as synonyms. Uh, but in this slide, uh, when you think race, think physical appearance. When you think ethnicity, think culture. That's the, that's the difference between these two terms. So some examples of race are uh, especially in the United States, white, black, Asian, Native American. Those are races. Examples of ethnicity then would be German, and I have that listed because that's my ethnicity. Uh, Kenyan, a Kenyan person is black. Uh, a Chinese person is Asian. A Cherokee person is Native American. Those are ethnic identities with cultural knowledges. Now, it should be noted that due to the nature of the institution of slavery, it can be very difficult for people of African American, of African descent, to determine their ancestors' nation of origin. So conversely, the knowledge of an ethnic origin of many white people's ancestors has been, has been preserved uh, due to their privilege, right? I know that my ancestry is German because we were capable, we were allowed to, it was legal for us to, 
write down where we came from and our names and all that. That was denied people who were kidnapped from Africa and forced to come here as uh, enslaved laborers, right? That, that, that is severed and people's names were changed and people's religions were stripped from them, right? Um, that's, that's a point of privilege when you are trying to understand your heritage. And that's, that's really, that's really deeply rough. So part of what makes talking about racism hard is that people have different definition of what racism is and what racism isn't. This is a major um, difficulty in conversation I have with my, my in-laws. And my father-in-law is a pretty enlightened guy, but because of generational differences and also because of, you know, my specialty as a, um, as a professional, uh, he has a different definition of racism than I do, right? So when asked the question, is racism bad, right? Nearly everybody living in our society today would say that yes, racism is bad. Bad. However, if you ask most older Americans, what is racism? Or can you give me an example of racism? They're likely to give answers that are different than that of younger Americans. And also, if you ask someone who's highly educated what is racism versus somebody with less education what is racism, they also are likely to give you different definitions. This is because the definition of racism, like all other social constructs, uh, is changing over time and actually over the last 20 years has changed quite dramatically. So, if you ask academic experts their definition of evidence, they are likely to give uh, different answers than non-experts. That is a typo right there. It should say their definition of racism, not their definition of evidence. Um, that is a weird typo, sorry about that. Uh, this is because many of the concepts surrounding the phenomena of racism are not widely understood. The general public is actually getting much better at understanding concepts surrounding racism, but there's still some murkiness there. And this is why I'm teaching you this so that you can help people understand, right? That's what we in sociology call public sociology. Unfortunately, when we're talking about this sensitive topic of racism, many academic experts forget that everybody isn't an expert in this regard. And this is something uh, that among professors, academic experts, whatever, really drives me nuts when people will just throw out a really complex vocabulary word and assume everybody knows what it is. Um, feminist scholars often do this when they're talking about hegemonic masculinity and toxic masculinity. It's like, wait, wait a minute, guys, you, you need to define that because not everyone knows what it is. So this phenomena of kind of the, um, you could say arrogant or maybe just, you know, absent-minded, let's give it that, of academics to say things like, well, there's no such thing as racism against white people. Whoa, what, what do you, what, what? Because I think maybe I have experienced racism against white people. What are you talking about? That statement, there is no such thing as racism against white people is actually mostly true, right? There, that, that is something, that is a statement that is backed up by social scientific evidence. However, it requires explanation. And I'll do that later in this lecture. Um, and so because, and really this is a problem with public conversations we're having in our society is people just don't really talk to each other uh, th this lack of communication, this using of different vocabularies is really uh, a point of confusion and anger on both or on all sides of an issue. So let's look at those definitions of racism. We're going to start with the general definition of racism that almost everyone, everyone in our society agrees on. Definition one of racism is racism is the belief that certain racial or ethnic groups are inferior to others, right? So you're straight up Nazi racism, that's what we're talking about there. So the racist 
typically, but does not always, believe that their race is, is the superior one, right? It's like, well, I'm white and I'm the best, so therefore everyone who isn't white is not as great as I am, right? Now, this definition of racism does acknowledge that racism can be either conscious or subconscious, right? Maybe I'm aware, I'm a full-blown member of the Ku Klux Klan, I'm, and I'm a terrible person, or uh, maybe I'm just not really aware of it, I'm not thinking about it, right? If you have a little, slightly more nuanced definition of this definition of racism. So, and it should be pointed out that this is the most common definition of racism in our society, and nearly everyone agrees that this type of racism, even my family members who are, are racist, right? But everyone agrees that this type of racism is bad. And actually, when we look at the history of our country over the last 50 years, that's really good, right? That's a good step in the right direction that we all agree that this definition, we agree on this definition. However, we have moved on as a society and we've gotten better. And part of that get, getting better is getting everyone on board with this second definition of racism. Racism being a social structure, just like education or family or government, right? And these other struct, like these other structures, racism is deeply embedded in our society. Government is part of our society, whether you like government or not, as is education, as are corporations, right? These things aren't going anywhere. And similarly, racism is embedded in our society and structural racism then may be committed or enforced by people who are not personally racist, they're just doing their job. And I will define structural racism and institutional racism in a few slides. So from this definition then, racism is just part, it's part of society, right? So um, this structure was not created all at once, but rather it built slowly over time in the United States. And we are going to look at right, the American history to give a better understanding of where this structure actually came from, right? Because social structures don't just pop out of nothing, right? Social structures are built slowly over the course of history. And that's what we're looking at right now. So we're gonna look at the historic roots of modern racism right now. Uh, there are some minor disclaimers here. I already kind of addressed this. In the following slides, I'm going to lay out a really wildly abbreviated timeline. I'm leaving a lot of things out for sure. I could absolutely teach entire courses on the subject of uh, structural racism and the history of structural racism in the United States. And I also acknowledge that as a white person, I am not the ideal person to be presenting this information. But with that said, just like as a uh, heterosexual man, I'm not the ideal person to be presenting on feminist issues. I know, I know a bit about these subjects. So I'm just with all that said, those disclaimers said. So, and one of the reasons this information is important to go over is so that we can acknowledge that racial tensions are by no means new to the United States. Many of the phenomena that we are aware of today have been happening for a very, very long time. The difference is that more people are becoming aware of the issues. And when we look at these issues, uh, things like police brutality, things like uh, killing of young black men by authority figures. For some people, this is new information, especially people outside of African American and other minority communities. But these things have been happening for generations. It's just people outside of those minority communities, i.e. white people, are becoming aware of the problem. Uh, we can point to the Rodney King beating in uh, the early 1990s as the first point of evidence that many white people had that police brutality was actually real, right? Um, that Anyway, 
Uh, for a more complete exploration of race and racism in the United States, I'm going to be giving it in the following slides, but if you're really interested in this topic, I suggest checking out a book called A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. You can find it online for free in a few places, or you can get a used copy off Amazon for pretty cheap. So, uh, furthermore, many groups have been mistreated in American history. That's absolutely true. This includes exploitation of immigrants from Germany, from Italy, from Ireland, uh, from many parts of Asia, Mexico, and other Latin American uh, nations. Any immigrant group that has come to the United States has been taken advantage of to a certain degree, but then also it certainly also includes the abuse of Native American peoples and the horrifying mistreatment and murder of many of them in our nation's history. Well, I'm not saying in this presentation that focuses mostly on African Americans that these other groups haven't also been victims, but uh, specifically right now, if we're talking about racism, uh, as we often do, we're focusing on African Americans. So, and this is because the social institution of slavery laid a very troubling groundwork for the relationship between the white dominant culture and black people in our society. This is why so much of the academic work surrounding racism explores the relationship between black people and white people. And the following slides are going to lay that out. And I, I say that again, I could easily teach it. I, I, that's a messed up. That shouldn't even be on the slide. Um, if you are interested in uh, some of that phenomena of how uh, the institution of slavery kind of survives to this day, uh, there is an author named Angela Davis. Uh, she wrote a book called Our Prisons Obsolete. Our Prisons Obsolete. It's a really good book. And she, in that book, she makes the argument that the prison system is laid, was intentionally laid out to be a mirror of the slavery system. I don't really fully agree with that argument that Davis makes but it's very intellectually interesting. And it's, the book's about 120 pages. So if that's interesting to you, go check that out. So when we look at this timeline, it's important to note the duration between events, right? We humans have kind of a pathetically short memory, right? Uh, we, we, if we're really deeply respective of our, our ancestors, we may have a good relationship with our grandparents and maybe we'll know some things about our great grandparents, but very few people know anything about their great, great grandparents. So that's going back about a hundred years, right? Almost nobody has a memory or knowledge of their family or of their community going back farther than a hundred years. And many of these these incidents surrounding racism in our society go back hundreds of years. So in 1607, uh, Jamestown was founded, which was the first British colony in North America. And in 1619, the first slaves arrived at Jamestown, Virginia. Uh, so what is that? What's the point? Well, that says to us that that only 12 years after the founding of Jamestown, they were bringing in slaves, right? They were bringing in kidnapped people from Africa to do their work for them. It should be noted 1619 is 157 years before 1776. This is something that we often gloss over, right? We see those numbers before 1900 and we just ignore them. It was 150 years before, right? That's a long period of time. Then in 1776, in 1788, 1788 is when uh, the Constitution of the United States was ratified. Uh, during the conversations surrounding the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and the Constitution itself, slavery remained controversial, right? Uh, the Founding Fathers didn't just uh, not argue about slavery. There were people active and given there that there were people who had slaves. Thomas Jefferson had slaves. George Washington had slaves. Many of the, of the founding fathers had slaves, but then there were other people 
famously Alexander Hamilton, who were anti-slavery as well. Um, so, so there was a, there was a conversation there and that intense argument and debate, argument and debate are part of what make of the American fabric will remain highly controversial until the spark of the civil war. On April 12th, 1861, the civil war starts at Fort Sumter. That is 85 years since 1776. That is the lifespan of an old person, right? That, that, that controversy continued and remained. And then on January 1st, 1863, two years later, after the start of the Civil War, Lincoln declared all persons held as slaves within the, that should say area, sorry, within the area and henceforth shall be free. So what was he saying? The slaves are free, right? Now, obviously, uh, the, the Confederacy did not acknowledge that, but what uh, what uh, Lincoln was saying was like, listen, we are still all the same country, kind of like the big political difference and turmoil between the North and the South during that era, right? On April 9th, 1865, the Civil War ended, right, up by, and it ended via the, the military domination of the North, uh, of the South by the North, right? The, the North had its military victories and was able to break down the Confederate government. Uh, on June 19th, 1866, then, this is uh, what we now know as Juneteenth. Uh, on, the, on June 19th, 1866, the last of the slaves were freed from captivity by uh, U.S. Army soldiers in Galveston, Texas. So basically what happened was, uh, as uh, the U.S. Army, the, the Union Army, moved its way through the South. The very last point of moving through the South, they, uh, they freed those people who were in bondage uh, in Galveston, Texas, and thus ending slavery for all people in the United States. And uh, thus, slavery existed in the United States for 256 years years, right? It's only been 159 years since the end of slavery, right? So people, African American people were enslaved for a longer period of time than since they were not enslaved, right? That That's very significant. It also should be pointed out that uh, there were people still being held in slavery for three years after uh, President Lincoln uh, said that slavery was done, right? That, that, that was not, it was a controversial thing, right? Uh, controversies don't just fizzle and go away. That's what, something I want to drive home here. Regarding slavery, it is true that slavery has existed in many place, places around the world, and slavery does continue to exist illegally to this day. And this typically takes the form of what we now call human trafficking, right? And those people who are, are trafficked uh, in that way, often they are sex slaves. Sometimes they are domestic workers as well, though. However, the combination of the social construction of race as it existed in the United States and some other countries with the industrialized technology made American slavery the most brutal form of slavery in world history. Let's rephrase that. The way we decided to bond slavery with race makes it unique. In previous forms of slavery, just because of what you looked like did not necessarily mean you were free or you were a slave. The fact that you could look at a person and say, you are a slave, you are somebody's property, that made the difference. And then additionally, because uh, metal, ergy, sciences, construction, and all of that, because industrialization was kicking into place, it was possible to create new devices, new punishment devices, new 
uh, types of buildings uh, that made it possible for uh, slave owners to own and control far greater numbers of people than were previous, right? In previous versions of slavery, one person might have up to five slaves, but in within the plantation system, uh, it was hundreds of slaves, right? It, it was a lot, of, it, it could be a lot of slaves. Uh, not necessarily all of them were hundreds of slaves, but that was that was a possibility. If you want to read more on that, uh, you can uh, check out this article. It's really pretty good. That's an archive from understandingslavery.com. You can just go to understandingslavery.com and get the more up-to-date version of the website. But this article I found really kind of broke out uh, the brutality of these instruments that were used uh, to uh, punish uh, punish people who were in bondage. I, I show these pictures, these recreation pictures of living people. These, these people in these images are volunteers that want to help show what it really looked like. Um, I, I, I think it's important to look at these images because these old drawing images, I don't think capture the humanity of the individual being punished by these things. And I think it's important to, um, to look at what it really looked like. So during Reconstruction, uh, this is the period in which the North was rebuilding the South um, or giving funds to rebuild the South. Laws were put into place in an attempt to control newly free slaves. So state governments in the South were going along with, okay, we, we begrudgingly acknowledge that uh, the North, uh, well, that the North or that the United States is in charge. We are no longer our own country, but we are going to pass these laws that were colloquially known as Jim Crow laws that eventually created segregation. And many of these laws were established in the mid 1800s and remained in place until the mid 1900s. These were what created sub segregation. Uh, the civil rights movement then went from the 1950s and 60s and that challenged the contribution uh, and contributed to the end of segregation. So um, one more point I wanna put in there that I didn't put in, just because Jim Crow laws and segregation were enforced in the South does not mean that there were not practices and uh, really severe nasty racism also happening in the North, also happening in the West. Um, the whole way across the United States, there were racist things happening. The only difference is uh, in the South that it was codified into law. It was, it was basically more direct, even though very racist, dangerous racism was ha happening across the country. Uh, the civil rights movement was about a 10 year period. The black power movement came after the civil rights movement uh, in which um, it went from being a kind of a passive a non-aggressive movement. The Black Power movement was very much a smaller movement, but was very much more about activating and galvanizing and empowering uh, Black and African American communities. If you want to learn more about that, because a lot of us didn't learn about that in high school, I suggest checking out a film called The Black Power Mixtape. It's a really good, very personal history of the Black Power movement. And then in 2013, uh, Black Lives Matter starts, right? And I want to point out again, in duration of time, that Black Lives Matter, that is doing a lot of the same work that the Civil Rights Movement did, happened 50 years after the Civil Rights Movement happened. And then on June 18th, 2021, uh, Juneteenth was finally recognized as a federal holiday for the first time. That's 155 years after the first Juneteenth. Now that's not really that uh, outrageous. We didn't really celebrate July 4th as a national holiday until the late 1800s, right? It takes a while for a holiday to get up off the ground, but um, it, it does show definitely a progress and a change in our national character that Juneteenth is now recognized as a national holiday. It shows good progress. So let's talk about some of the related concepts surrounding race in the United States. So 
Uh, prejudice and discrimination. These are two concepts very closely related to understanding race and ethnicity. Prejudice is a set of negative attitudes, beliefs, and judgment about whole categories of people and about individual members of those categories because of their perceived race and or ethnicity. The easy way to think about it is that prejudice is a thought process. These are the think, the, the thinks, the thoughts people have about groups of people, right? Prejudice could be conscious or subconscious, right? We'll talk about that more in a few slides. Discrimination then relating to racial and ethnic inequality, because there can be many types of discrimination, is the arbitrary denial of rights, privileges, and opportunities to members of subordinate racial and ethnic groups, right? So discrimination is a behavior. Prejudice is a thought process. Discrimination is a behavior. It is acting on your prejudice. Individual, there are two types of discrimination in general. Individual discrimination and institutional discrimination. Individual discrimination is that which individual practices in their day-to-day -day lives. So if you do something to discriminate against somebody on your own accord, that is individual discrimination. Institutional discrimination then is a discrimination that pervades the practices of entire institutions, such as housing, medical care, law enforcement, etc., even if that institution that discrimination is not intended. These are these are big ideas. So I'm going to give a couple examples in the following slides. So example one, uh, Jerry manages a grocery store and he is in charge of hiring for the store. Jerry thinks that Mexicans are lazy, but he it, that doesn't impact uh, who he hires. There are several Mexican and Latinx people working in the store, right? So thus, Jerry is prejudiced. He has the thought process, but he is not discriminating. If he were to be discriminating, this would be individual discrimination, but he's not. He, he just has prejudice in his brain. And it's very hard to gauge whether people are prejudiced it's easier to gauge if people are discriminating because we can see their behaviors and actions. Example two is the year is 1956. Terry's church is actively involved in the civil rights movement and Terry is actively and willingly part of that. So Terry individually by the standards of that society is anti-racist. But in his professional life, Terry is a car salesman and a black man wants to buy a car from Terry's lot. However, the owner of the lot has a policy of never selling to black people. And today, uh, that would be totally illegal. But in 1956, depending on where he is in the country, that could be legal, right? Uh, thus, in this situation, Terry is proven to be not prejudiced in his personal life, but he is discriminating against black people because of the institutional discrimination of the of that um, car lot that has been put together by his boss right it doesn't matter what terry actually believes terry is discriminating and it is institutional discrimination is what is happening there this is it's really hard to combat institutional discrimination. It's, it's way more difficult than individual discrimination. Stereotypes then are simplified mistaken generalizations about people because of their race, ethnicity, or some other aspects. And we all know what stereotypes are. This is just giving a definition to the thing. Stereotypes may be based in reality or observations, uh, outside, in observations outsiders may have of a certain group. So it might be based on something that people actually see, or it could be entirely unfounded, right? Some stereotypes have no grounding whatsoever, 
some stereotypes uh, are based on cultural practices that are misunderstood. Stereotypes can be positive or negative. An example of a positive stereotype is all Asians are good at math. That's simply not true. Asian is a massive, Asia is a massive place. There are many, many Asian people of Asian descent all around the world. All of them can't be good at math, right? Um, so, so the point there is stereotypes can be positive too. That doesn't mean that that's good. The problem with stereotypes then is the application of an assumption to all members of a given group. If somebody is uh, Asian and you assume that they're good at math and this person isn't good at math, you then could uh, be uh, mean to them when they can't actually solve a really complex thing that's put in front of them, right? So even good stereotypes aren't good. Sociological studies have shown that people with certain personality types have very different tendencies when it comes to both prejudice and discrimination. Specifically, people with authoritarian personality types have been found to have higher rates of racial and ethnic prejudice. What's an authoritarian personality type? It is a personality emphasizing obedience to authority, a rigid adherence to the rules, and low acceptance of people not like oneself. Authority, authoritarian personality types, um, they think the way they do things is the good and right way to do things and nothing else is acceptable is another way to put it. Now that does not mean that everyone of an authoritarian personality type is racist. It doesn't mean that. My grandfather was a man who, who very much had authoritarian tendencies. He had very distinct attitudes of the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. He also was a world traveler and did have uh, relationships and friendships with people of different races as well. So I'm pretty sure he was uh, not racist. However, he, he was of that belief standard. So, but, but there is a tendency for authoritarian personality people, a, a greater tendency for them. You could call it a risk factor uh, for them to become racist, just like uh, cer uh, certain um, genetic or dietary risk factors go into uh, you having high cholesterol, right? It doesn't mean you will have high cholesterol. You can do things about it, but it's a risk factor. Frustration theory then, this is a sociological theory, states that individuals often blame the problems they experience on racial or ethnic minorities, known as scapegoats. They then blame members of those groups instead of recognizing the real source of their own misfortune. And this type of behavior is especially common in a society that is not functioning and especially in an economy that is not working the, w the best way it can for all people. So on the micro level, an individual could blame their personal inability to find employment on immigrants. Oh, they're taking all our jobs, right? While on the macro level, the big level, the national level, laws may be being put into place to limit immigration with the motivation of protecting American jobs regardless of the evidence happening there. So the micro there is an example of how an individual can blame a certain group. The macro level we're seeing here is what it would look like for the nation to start blaming immigrants on, on that sort of thing, again, regardless of evidence. In the early 2000s, social scientists proved that most people in society do have typically subconscious prejudices against certain types of people, depending on uh, the individual. And these prejudices are called implicit bias. This is one of the major findings of uh, sociology specifically in the last 20 years. Uh, you can actually do your own implicit bias search. Uh, you just search, do Google search implicit bias test and the Harvard implicit bias test is, a, is especially good. Uh, basically what we do here when you take an implicit bias test is 
uh, you put your fit, you're sitting in front of your computer, and most of you are probably sitting in front of a computer of one kind or another, maybe with a keyboard, you could do this, just like, just, just think about what this would be like. My fingers are right now on the F key and the J key. Those are kind of the, your pointer finger keys, right? So what happens is, uh, in an implicit bias test, you are told, okay, every single time you see a black person, you hit that J key to signify black or good, right? Every time you see a black person, and then you, you, you follow those directions and you hit the J. And then you, uh, they say, okay, next round, every time you see a white person, you click that J key again, white or good. Okay, I'm doing that. And then it cycles through and then uh, you would hit, be hitting the F key for white or bad, black key for black or bad, etc. right? And you work through all the permutations. Well, how that works then is actually with the physiology of your individual body. They are able to prove that your motor neurons in your brain there is a stronger electrical connection in your brain if you possess implicit bias against black people, for example, that you would be faster to hit white or good than you would be able to hit black or good. It's really wild stuff. And you can even sometimes observe it in your own body if you're taking an implicit bias test. It's really, really quite amazing. Um, and just because you have, though, if you do take an implicit bias test, I want you to know, just in case you have an implicit bias, it does not mean that you will act on those biases, right? It doesn't mean that. It just means it's something in your brain. As a matter of fact, um, the identification of implicit bias uh, can help you. Um, if you engage in contact theory, you can fix it. And that's something my friend, uh, my friend Cheryl, who used to work for the Mershon Center at Ohio State, she called that the good news of implicit bias, is that uh, you can, well, let me read through the definition of contact theory. Contact theory states that if members of two groups come in contact with each other, it will diminish the effects of both prejudice and discrimination. This is a pretty old uh, sociological idea. I think it goes back to the 1960s. What implicit bias testing does is it proves on a neurochemical level that people have these biases and in contact with people of the group that they have these biases against, it will diminish the bias, right? So what that does then is the more contact with a person or group, the better, the, the less your bias will become. So put an example, if you were found to have um, implicit bias against African Americans, what you could do is you could uh, read, uh, read some writings of uh, Martin Luther King. It could be even something as um, seemingly not as serious. Uh, you could watch some uh, programming from BET, or maybe you could watch some uh, programming about documentaries about people living in Africa, even. And through that expo exposure, you your implicit bias would lessen. And it sounds almost silly, but that's that's the scientific data and the scientific reality, and it's 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 amazingly uh, remarkable. White privilege then is the advantage that white people enjoy in their daily lives simply because they are white, whether or not they are aware of these advantages, right? You can be white and not be aware of your white privilege. You still have white privilege, right? A concept tied into that is uh, known as white fragility. This is the inability of many white people, not all white people, but many white people to confront their own privilege and how they have benefited from structural racism. And this white fragility uh, phenomena may be made worse by previous education experiences and preconceptions. Uh, basically, 
the less you have learned, the less you know about phenomena surrounding racism, usually the stronger white fragility can be. And, um, and it's tough and it sucks, right? If you're confronted with your own behavior, that you come to the realization that, wow, that is racist or, and it applies to sex too. Wow, what I'm doing is, is wrong, right? The, it is a human reaction to be afraid and maybe angry at the person pointing it out, right? Uh, the reality of the matter is that probably most of us as white people need to be a little bit less sensitive when these things are pointed out because it's, um, it's, it's the only way that we as a society are going to get better. In the 1990s then, um, it was a really weird time in terms of race relations. Uh, in addition to being the era where people would say, well, I don't see race, I treat everybody equally. It was also a decade in which affirmative action became a common concept. So this is really exemplified, and you can um, Google search this as well, uh, the United Colors of Benetton. Uh, Benetton was a uh, clothing manufacturer, very popular in the mid 90s. Uh, they would have these, these weird um, images of people of different races together. And it seemed like in their uh, advertising, they were just trying to get one person of every race in that ad without really thinking about if the image made any sense, right? Under what conceivable circumstances would this white lady and this black lady be holding an Asian child in a blanket? What's happening here? Are we implying that white person plus black person makes Asian baby, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a weird image. Similarly weird were the original affirmative action policies. So these were policies in which special consideration for minorities and women in their employment and education uh, to compensate for the discrimination and lack of opportunities they experience uh, in larger society. What, what the hell does that mean? Well, what it means is that affirmative action policies were being put into place in the United States as a certain form of social engineering that we were acknowledging that yes, black people and people of other races were being discriminated against in a systematic way in our past, right? And it is not fair that it, it's, we're stating it, it's reality, but it's not fair that the great, great grandparents of the wealth of our great, great grandparents has an impact on the wealth of us today, right? I, I know, and I am sure that the fact that my grandfather had certain opportunities because he was a white person to make an amount of money to allow my mother to get an education and then my mother made a, more money that and she emphasized education and that more money allowed me and encouraged me to get an education of my own, right? Family lines, family histories have a big part to play in our, our lives today, right? Affirmative action policies were put into place acknowledging that phenomena. And in their clunky 1990s way of trying to fix the problem, just like the United Colors of Benetton ad, they said, okay, let's just get more black people and put them in the position. Let's just do that. That sounds great. Let's just do it. And so to alleviate the structural racism and sexism and whatever that was established in the past, they decided they would intentionally hire more discriminated against people in the present, which was the 1990s, so that things could be better in the future, right? Which on its surface, theoretically, looks pretty good, actually, 
But if you don't think about the people in front of you today and what that means for people and some of the ramifications both for white people that didn't get jobs and also the black people that did get those jobs being put into white organizations because, well, he was the affirmative action candidate and how that stigmatized people, it, it, it just didn't work very well at all. However, affirmative action absolutely can work. Affirmative action has that negative quality to it, the negative reputation, because it was very clumsy in the early 1990s. Since then, affirmative action policies actually have evolved to a great degree and actually have become quite successful. And additionally, you can trace the current diversity in the workplace where it exists today to those clumsy policies of the 1990s. I mean, they sucked, they were awkward, but they worked, right? It, which is, is academically very interesting and socially pretty frustrating, right? Um, and the many, many uh, organizations, they currently still, they continue to have affirmative action policies because they worked and they, they were effective. Uh, but uh, just like early sexual harassment policies and trainings, uh, they had to, uh, basically HR groups, social scientists, we had to figure out how to make it actually make sense. Now, if you wanna look at some interesting alternatives and more nuanced versions of affirmative action policies, uh, you can check out page 105 of our textbook, and there are some very uh, good explanations there if you want to read more about that. With all of that said, as I mentioned, much of the diversity we see in our current workplace has been created uh, by those original policies of the 90s, which, just like the United Colors of Benetton, were just as, just as awkward as the Burger King Kids Club that has one black guy, one Asian guy, one guy in a wheelchair whose nickname was Wheels. Um, all of these elements here, um, they, they, they were really trying in the 90s, but it was awkward and weird and not good enough for the standards of us today. Um, and as this whole presentation was all about, you have to understand your past if you're gonna understand the present. Okay, if you have any questions on any of the content in this lecture, please feel free to send me an email. Um, this is a, a really deeply intriguing topic, a very personal topic. And uh, anything I can clarify, I am happy to do so. Because, you know, this is how we get better as a society. Okay, thanks everyone. See you later.